welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about world affairs and the people who shape it. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch, and in this show we discuss topical global issues and have in-depth conversations with personalities in foreign policy. Global Dispatches is presented in partnership with Humanity in Action, an international educational organization, and I am a Humanity in Action senior fellow. My guest today, Chris Blattman, is a development economist who routinely conducts experiments to test ideas related to reducing poverty and improving the well-being of people living in poor countries. His latest experiment takes on the question of sweatshops, whether they are good for the poor, exploitative, or perhaps something else. Along with his colleague Stefan Durkan, Chris went to Ethiopia and performed the first randomized trial of industrial employment on workers. They went to five factories and followed 947 applicants who were and were not offered a job for over a year, surveying them multiple times. As Chris and Stefan wrote in a New York Times op-ed about their research, everything they thought they knew about sweatshops turned out to be wrong. Regular listeners will recognize Chris's name from a profile episode we did a couple of years ago in which Chris describes how he became so interested in development economics and also some of his groundbreaking research on unconditional cash transfers to extremely poor people in Uganda. This is a good one. I love having conversations in which wonky research papers on important topics get broken down in ways that are interesting and understandable and accessible to your average global affairs enthusiast, which I think you are if you're listening to this podcast. Before we jump into the episode, though, I do want to make one more pitch for you to become a premium member and support the show. And in return, you get great rewards like complimentary access to my Don's Digest Global News Clips service, which is my handpicked and curated selection of the most important news from around the world delivered to your inbox every single morning. That is just one of many bonuses that you can earn if you become a premium member and support the show. Thank you so much. Click the link on globaldispatchespodcast.com or follow the link in the description field of this podcast episode in iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast to become a premium member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now here is Chris Blattman. For a long time, I'd had this idea in my head that, you know, sweatshop jobs are so bad why are people lining up for this work when it becomes available? Or so it seems, you know, an economist would say by revealed preference, you know, if people are lining up by revealed preference, they must, they must prefer this work to their, to their alternatives. And, and for someone like me, who'd spent a lot of time uh, on different continents, working in very poor villages and, you know, among other things, trying to understand why some people were so poor and what kinds of interventions could, could could help households rise out of that. Um, you know, I could see that the kinds of work that most households did, even if they were pretty successful, were pretty miserable, were pretty volatile. This could be farming. This could be, uh, you know, running a little shop, selling the same 30 crummy goods that every, you know, the other 40 shops on the same street are selling and so on. And so, um, so, so I didn't have, I didn't. I didn't have a very high opinion of a lot of this informal work. I, th- I, I realized that a lot of, you know, "quote unquote" good jobs, you know, white collar government jobs, are out of the range of most of the world's population, just because there aren't that many of those jobs. And, and and these industrial jobs might actually be much better than people thought. And and what better way to test that than if you have a lineup of two hundred people around the block for fifty jobs? to to run this and with the same kind of randomized control trial that we would run for one of our other development projects and and then follow these people over time. So so this was always in my my mind is would this be a neat thing to be able to do? We could really speak to these debates uh and and then it was just a question of figuring out how we could do that. And and what is like what was I should say the debate before you embarked on your research? Was it really kind of between people who think sweatshops are exploitative and you know keep workers in in misery versus people who say I think the quote is something like the the worse than being exploited is not being exploited at all? Like right. is that the kind of debate that you were trying to trying to figure out? 
Well, there. So there's. It's never easy to caricature uh, a debate, and and what I, the one thing I've learned from this and some other papers, but especially this paper, that if you try to make the statement, this is what people believe. Uh, before and this is this is what we're speaking to. A lot of people get their backs up because they say, "Well, we didn't actually believe that." So, and and I think sometimes their opinion of what they believed before changes once they hear the result. Not because they, not not because 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 I think what what we found makes a lot of sense. And so people are like, "Oh yeah, I guess I kind of believed that before." But I, 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 I what people believed is a hard to measure and moving target. Is my point. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I had to sort of say what my intuition was or what I thought people believed, one is I thought there was a there is an activist community that's very skeptical of of sweatshops and understandably slow. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of problems with with these jobs, and in absolute terms, they might be they might be relatively bad. Uh, no, sorry, in absolute terms, they might be bad in the sense that they're unhealthy or they're unpleasant or they're not particularly nice work. And I think there was a point made by some economists that. Uh, in relative terms, however bad these jobs are, they still might be better than people's miserable alternatives. That that mucking around in a rice field is also pretty bad. And if you and if you're some sort of uh, if you're some activist in a faraway place, it's easy to romanticize, you know, working for yourself in a rice field without understanding some of the the, the deep problems and unpleasantness of that work and the risks. Um, and so that 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 was that's one way to look at it. Some economists also thought that actually, you know, some firms, many firms, have an incentive to to pay their workers better. So that if you do join a large firm, in this case, a manufacturing firm, but really any firm, often firms would have might have an incentive to pay people better than their alternatives because mm-hmm. because it's going to elicit higher productivity, and so it's a good deal for both. It's a win win situation. And there's some evidence of that. So, so it might be that these factory jobs aren't just better in, in relative terms, but actually end up giving people what economists would call rents, like some 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 added benefits that they that they wouldn't normally get for their labor. So, how did you go about designing this experiment? Well, so designing the experiment is really easy. You just sort of let people walk up to take the job, and you know, flip sort of a, a virtual coin. Um, getting to that point was the tricky part. Uh, I, I did, don't know a lot of industrialists. I guess I could have gone it, in retrospect, it turns out, I think I could have gone to any country and gone door knocking and I would have found some cooperative firms because eventually that's what we had to do in Ethiopia to get, to get all the firms we worked with. But the first, the first one, uh, came from sort of happenstance encounter. I was in London at a conference. The international growth center is a Oxford and and uh, and and London School of Economics annual conference that an, an organization that tries to bring together people like me, so academics and policymakers and people in the real world to talk about what the problems are, and then to sort of find collaborative problems to work on. And and this was the very first uh, IGC conference. And they had had this Ethiopian industrialist out to sort of lecture economists on what it really meant to run businesses in developing countries and what the real challenges were. And then to have a discussion about, you know, whether, whether we were all focused on the right things or not, or at least just to inform us. And he's a really smart guy. His name's Ermia Samelga. He was U.S. raised. Uh, I don't know the story. I'm guessing like many Ethiopians, his family fled uh, at some point over the, you know, in the late 20th century, raised their children in in the United States. He became sort of a successful person in the investment area here, made some money, and then decided he wanted to go back to Ethiopia and start some businesses and 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 did and 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 sort of do development, make some money, but also do development. By, by actually building things rather than say writing a research paper mm-hmm. and um, a doer we call them yeah exactly <laughs> which I think is fabulous I mean yeah. he's, he's become a, he's he was probably one of the two or three wealthiest people in the country eventually and uh, at least at the time when I met him and is also is now and remains a very controversial figure because of some real estate deals that went south that's that's another story that's all after the fact. Um, but Ethiopian listeners would recognize his name because he's one of the most notorious businessmen in good and bad ways in the country. In the country, 
Um, so, so you found him and he was open to letting you um, check out some of his factories? Right. So he was – at that moment in time, he thought that uh, – he had just, he'd just bought and refurbished an old water bottling company that essentially was almost out of operation because he went to Ethiopia to sort of look for investment opportunities and figure out where he could make his mark. And he – one of the first things he did, as he tells it, is he went to a grocery store and he bought a bottle of water and he went up to the cash and they said, oh, it's – you know, the Ethiopian equivalent of $3, which is an absurd price anywhere in the world to pay for a bottle of water. Unless you're like on an airplane or, you know, in a hotel, like you never pay $3 for a bottle of water, right? Uh, so this extortion, and he looked at the bottle and it was imported from somewhere in the Middle East. Maybe it was Yemen or whatever. He says, wait a second, we are the source of the Nile. Uh, and we're importing water from a desert. Like, how is that possible? And and they're selling these bottles for three dollars, and and you couldn't buy like a liter bottle or a five liter bottle or the big tanks if you wanted them, presumably. And so he he bought he, he went and found this sort of barely in operation beverage bottling operation, and he bought it and he refurbished it and he got it up and running, and he made a mint for a short while until eight other firms uh, started started selling bottled water as well. And before you knew it, there was a healthy competitive marketplace in Ethiopia and you could buy water for whatever, you know, far, far, far less than $3. So terrific. I mean, he's, he made some money. He ignited an industry uh, that was moribund and there's, there's a lot of consumers who gained from that. So, so fabulous. Uh, he did more for development like that one act than most of us do with a career of research or NGO work. Um, and so he said, wow, I could keep doing this. Like there are a hundred industries. There's no shortage of moribund factories and people. And I, I know how to make this happen. I have the capital. I can, I can do this. And so, uh, so when I met him, he was feeling very optimistic about opening dozens of factories and dozens of industries. And, and he was enthusiastic about this project basically because he, he believed that he was, you know, these factories and these jobs were good jobs. And, and he agreed that he fought this sort of attitude very often that um, that 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 these were problematic jobs, and and so he'd he'd love to be able to show that he wants to prove true. that he is like being you know beneficent by. Yeah, by, but he said by you know they're right. Jobs, you know maybe yeah. they're maybe people are miserable. Maybe these aren't good jobs in some way, and I'd like to know if so. Mm -hmm. And and by and large, so so eventually we got to do a couple of cohorts at one of his water factories. So each time they maybe expanded a line in order to move into juice or to have a five liter instead of a one liter bottle and so forth. Like we'd be able to 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 and they'd need to hire fifty people. We'd we'd run our our study mm -hmm. with them and we'd 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 do this randomized trial. But but he um but but we 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 ended up having to knock on the doors of hundreds of other factories to try to find more factories to work with. Partly because he he soon realized that this was really hard money to earn relative to his other opportunities that that running a manufacturing plant was really really difficult it was difficult because there were all these regulations it mm -hmm. was difficult you know it was a really for me it was a really instructive experience just to watch him try to succeed and where he succeeded and failed what he struggled like it, it, i learned a lot about development rich large kind of by watching this this early industrialization and progress especially through this lens you know he, he just real and, and plus it, it was really hard for him to find good staff he, whether he wanted whether it was somebody to like do the 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 handle the merger and acquisition side when he found a company he wanted to get and do like an audit or due diligence or whether it was just finding a human resource manager that could like run it so that he didn't have to micromanage all these operations. He just found it really, really difficult. And then, you know, getting the equipment in, getting the government permissions and things. And it just, it was just was too much work. And meanwhile, there was all this money to be made in real estate uh, because there was sort of seemed to, seemed to be like an, an, this un this boundless demand for, for condos mm -hmm. and, and and he was good at that too. So we it's funny. I went to I've, I've, the last time I was in Ethiopia was probably like eight years ago. But you know, like the further you drive outside of town, like the more construction there is. Like right. like and in any like in any booming town cranes. here and yeah, yeah, like like I'm in Denver right now and there are cranes all over the city. This is a boom town right, right now, and it's exactly what what Ethiopia was like eight years ago. Yeah, and so there's a good chance that exactly eight years ago, half the cranes above the city were his. Yeah. Um, well, there you go. So, so you know, he was he was, and that's one reason. And then a lot of those collapsed for various reasons, and uh, 
and so that's that's one reason why he's embroiled in trouble now. But so, um, so, um, so you you identified his factory and a few others, right? And and how then did you um, sort of take measure of the workers and their happiness and and whether or not they stayed on the job and the kind of wages that that you run? Like, how did you actually conduct this experiment? Right. Well, so uh, so let's say there. Let's say this water bottling factory. We ended up working a water bottling plant. A um, a, a vegetable farm operation, so like a, almost like a like a industrial greenhouse operation, the same kind for flowers, uh, a shoe factory, and a textile and garment factory, uh, and the water bottling plant. So we got some diversity, and these were all over Ethiopia and different, you know, different different uh, cities, different um, sectors. So there was some nice diversity. And let's say one of these plants was opening up a new line, and they needed fifty new workers. Uh, there would very likely be a lineup. They, they post some signs around the factory and nearby, and they would they would have two or three hundred people lined up uh, on whatever day they proclaimed was the hiring day. And then they would go through, and they, normally they would have just taken people on a first come first serve basis if they had really basic requirements. Usually they were looking for either women or men, depending on the nature of the job, because the work was very uh, you know gender specific. Uh, in Ethiopia, they they would want all women in this line or all men in this line, and so forth. They they wanted to make sure people were able bodied, and they wanted to make sure they had a minimum education requirement, usually grade ten. And so that would screen out a certain people. You might be left with 150 people who passed this these these very basic tests that the employers had. At that point, they would have just taken the first 50 people, and this is where we step in and we say, okay, actually, we're going to interrupt this process. You know, with you know collaborate with them. We work closely with them. We say, this is where we step in. We do a survey of all 150 people that takes about an hour and a half and it's all personality and work experience and all these sorts of things that give us a sense of their backgrounds. Uh, and then they're told they're going to be entered into a lottery that every, to give everyone a fair shot at these jobs. There's 150 of them. There's 50 jobs. So, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a a a, a draw and and that's gonna be the sort of transparent and fair way in which they allocate the jobs and people were generally pretty happy with that. We also entered them into so fifty people would get the jobs then you'd have a hundred people who did not. We also um, offered to let them enter a, a draw which of course everyone entered which said well there's gonna be another fifty people we're in this draw we're going to give them some uh the opportunity to basically do to start their own business and so if you win that draw you'll get a few days of business training slash consulting and then a 300 hundred dollar grant uh, which you can really use as you please you can you can drink it away if you like but but uh the idea is that you know you'd be able to use most of it or some of it at least for starting up this business plan that you help develop over this two or three day training hmm. and so so in the end then you have a randomized trial you have uh, a group of people who who get the job or the job offer, I should say, a group of people who get this offer of of basic consulting and cash, and then a, a, a control group who sort of have whatever opportunities they they showed up that that day uh, still having, and and we followed them over a year. We basically tracked them down after eleven and again thirteen months uh, to measure all sorts of things, mostly economic activity and health and things. Uh, you know, twice around the the about a year later to try to get an accurate read. Income and, and employment in in the informal sector is so volatile that we wanted to get them twice over a short period of time to sort of get a more accurate measurement of their twelve of their twelve month activity. And and so, what did you find? So uh, the thing that became apparent long before we ever ran that one year survey was that people were not taking these jobs. Um, they, something like 10% never showed up the first day. We would contact them by phone to let them know they had the offer. And then one in 10 wouldn't show up the first day, huh. uh, which surprised us because they stood in line and, you know, but you know, people, maybe they get another job offer or something happens or whatever. So, so they don't show up. And, but then within about a month or so, I'd say another two or three in 10 have left the job. So they tried it. They mostly these are women. They're sort of in their early twenties. I'd say three quarters of them have never worked in the formal sector, let alone a factory before. Some have, but most have not. So you can kind of think of them as entering the formal sector labor market for the first time, and they're trying it out. And they're saying, mm, "This isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I expected." Or I, it's kind of what I expected, but actually, I, I, I just enjoy it a lot less than I thought I would. 
Uh, you know, so it's like a fast food job in some sense. The people mm. are going, going, oh my God. You know, they, fast food jobs aren't bad jobs. They're not like exploitative or things. I worked in Kentucky Fried Chicken for two years. Uh, I don't know why I stuck around for two years. It would have been a totally reasonable decision to quit after a few weeks. Indeed, in retrospect, maybe I should have. And like, there's a lot of good things I could have done with my time other than, than like clean grease traps. But, um, but, but, you know, that's, that's what happened. So, so, and then when we finally followed up people a year later, only I'd say a third were still in that or some other factory job. So basically, so after a year, only one third of the people who had accepted that initial job were still there one year later. Yeah, I think it was thirty two percent. If I rem- I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but that that sticks in my mind. And then of the control, you know, the control group, some of them were still interested in factory jobs. There are several factories around. Typically, this factory might have been hiring at a later date. We didn't blacklist them. So I think something like say 20% probably had found and were in a factory job at the end of the year. So getting this job offer, it wasn't this precious thing that people couldn't get. And then they, 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 they held on to rather, uh, you know, the different getting this initial job offer raised your probability of having this job a year later by only about 12 percentage points, 32% instead of 20%. So, so these jobs were just much more transitory, and much less desired than we than we thought, and and we talked to people, and you know I don't think we got a perfect picture of what's going on because we didn't we didn't get you know we talked to maybe a dozen or two dozen people and not hundreds of people. So, but but our sense is that there are two things going on. One is that uh, one is that people were relatively new to the sector and we're trying it out and realized, ah, you know, this, this actually isn't what I, I, I knew it was hard work. I'd heard it was hard work, but I didn't know it was that hard. And for this pay, mm, cause they didn't pay, it turned out they, you know, so they, they turned out they didn't pay that, that well. And I'll talk about that in a second. The, the second thing we, we heard was, um, was that, well, you know, these, you know, most, we, our other informal work is better. It pays better. It's more pleasant, but it's not always available. Maybe and these like, are things like farming or selling stuff at the market. That's what we're talking about. Or, like mm-hmm. or working or in a family thing. business, or maybe you get some temporary white collar work, or you know, the government also has a, 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 a cobblestone streets project, like a public works program for putting cobblestones on streets that pays reasonably well. Uh, even compared to both the informal sector and the factories, and and you can get a few weeks of work there. So they were, rather than like using the cobblestones or farming or their dad's shop as a fallback in when they can get factory jobs, for when they can't get factory jobs, which is what we thought was going on, they're using the factory jobs as a fallback. Hmm. So the factory jobs are saying, well, we really want a good job in the sense of I'd like to get like a like clerical work or work in a shop or – get a government job or, you know, work in a, a, a company behind a desk or, or something. And then I can fill in my time with sort of pretty variable, but decently paid informal work, like working for my friend's shop or, or doing some family farming or raising the cows. And is, and, is, is that because the, um, the factory work itself is like not pleasant, like, um, you know, harmful in any way or dangerous? Yeah. So there's two things. One is the factory jobs are basically just, you know, it, you can, if you have a factory, they don't pay any better than your outside option. They pay basically the same. If you get a factory job, you're guaranteed 40 to 50 hours of work a week. The wage is relatively low. Uh, and you earn like like X dollars, okay? And if you don't have factory work and do informal work, then most, you know, you're, you have variable work, but you can get about, you know, 30 hours a week on average over several weeks or months. And your pay is a bit higher. And it turns out that that in total, you earn about X amount. So the, you're getting the total is about the same. One's just a little bit more volatile than the other, but not not that much more, it turns out. So it's sort of like saying, oh, this is like, steady, daily, tedious work for about the same amount of money. So if I'm the kind of person who likes, who doesn't mind the tedious work and who doesn't mind uh, and, and who, who, who wants that stability, then I'll take that job. But if I'm anybody else, I don't want it. So that's one. But then the other is it turned out, and I don't think people fully appreciated this. I don't think the firms knew. I don't think the people knew because it's subtle, but the, the, the risk, the work was risky. I mean, all work is risky including their homework, but the factory work was riskier in some respects. 
uh, basically um, about, you know, after everybody started out in good health and after a year, people in the control group um, were, you know, maybe uh, I guess you could say like about one in, um, I don't know, like 3% or something like that. Three or 4% were reporting like a, a serious illness or infirmity or disability or temporary problem of some sort, something that impeded their ability to work in a serious way. And that was almost doubled in the group that was in the factory. And our sense, we're going back now actually to try to get some longer term information on this and and to see if it even persists. But our sense is that it's exposure to chemicals, uh, breathing things, particles in the air, repetitive stress injuries. Those seem to be the culprits. You know, it's a small number of people in total. Uh, we're talking like maybe, I don't know, 70 or 80 out of the thousand subjects in our study, something like that, reporting a serious problem. And that's just being proportionally higher in the group that, that got the, uh, the factory job. So it's small numbers, but, but nonetheless, things that they're, 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 they're serious and they are statistically significant. So we can't ignore them. And so it seems like this work was not, was risky, maybe in ways that were difficult to observe firsthand. You had a sense that this is unpleasant, you know, I'm fainting from the glue fumes a lot. Uh, but not necessarily appreciating that there, in some cases, this will this will cause long term damage. So, what of the group to which you gave three hundred dollars and some training? And and I should say that this uh, reminds me a lot of a previous experiment you did on the judging the, the utility and the value of of conditional and conditionless cash transfers, which is some mm-hmm. other kind of groundbreaking research you've done. I think it was in in Uganda for extremely yeah. poor people. Yeah, we we're um, also just following them up after ten years right now. Oh, okay. Um, so, so what did you find on, on, on that? Cause I know you, you've pioneered some, some work on, on that front. Um, what, what of that, that group that you gave the, the cash and the, the training to? So, so these people went and they did what people usually do with, with sort of young people with some, with some ideas and some, some interest in work get cash. Uh, they usually, especially a big lump sum, like $300, they, they usually invest, I'd say a third or half of it in some kind of enterprise. So it could be like a little shop or they're buying and reselling goods. So they're buying wholesale, selling retail. Uh, maybe they buy some livestock. They, they do a bunch of little businesses and, and uh, maybe they do a couple of those things and they make money as a result. And then they reinvest some of those earnings and they, they make a little bit more. And so they, they get a few extra hours of work a week. This isn't like a full-time job, but that it supplants some of the old low productivity stuff they were doing before. Now they're making a little bit more money. And in this case, I think their earnings went up by about a third compared to both the factory and the control group. That, that only amounts to, I can't remember what the exact amount was, like a few dollars a week maybe. So, cause they're, nobody's making much in this situation. But but if you're making very little and your earnings go up by a third, that's a pretty big deal actually. And so so this this investment, you know, pays itself back. This three hundred dollars pays itself back relatively quickly in the sense that they're able to earn far more than that three hundred dollars within a couple of years. So what's your big takeaway from from your research from this experiment? Um okay so I'll tell you one thing it's not which some people jump to, but the conclusion we do not jump to is that we should give cash transfers instead of factories. Um, that's just not, that's not really a growth strategy. I mean, if, if a country wants to go from 2000 to 12,000 ahead, uh, in terms of their per capita incomes, then there, we really, unless they're sitting on a billion barrels of oil, we don't really know another way for them to do it except to through large firms and, and particularly industry and manufacturing, which tends to have, you know, a lot more value added in the sense of that, like it, it transforms human labor and capital into a lot more stuff than, than say the service industries, for example. And so, so the quickest way to get wealthy is probably to enter into manufacturing. What we learned is that this is, this is not necessarily, at least at this early stage, this is not necessarily such a good deal for the workers. It's not a bad deal for the workers, but the workers aren't getting the benefits, uh, the, the the lion's share of those those gains and profits are are going to the people who own the capital, probably, uh, and so that's 
like a familiar old story, but we thought it the was certainly plausible. The anti-capitalists were right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so it, it makes a lot of sense. If, and right, we also have to remember, this is five firms in one country, so let's not draw too many grand conclusions. But at least in this one case, it points us to – it points us to uh, – so we generalize with a lot of hesitancy. But it does point us to something that makes sense, which is that, well, there's lots and lots of – you know, labor uh, at this early stage of industrialization. And that's not scarce. And the capital is extremely scarce. And know-how is extremely scarce. So when when this when this industrialization happens, at least at its early stages, it's the people with the scarce things, the capital and the know-how and the technology and the who are gonna reap the gains because there's always somebody else who's willing to work for just a marginally greater wage or marginally greater stability or when their other thing doesn't pay out off. But when they don't have another option, they'll work for a while for these factories. So they're not worse off. I mean, these health things need to be explored more. Maybe they are worse off. Um, but, but, uh, but, but generally the, you know, the scarce resources are getting the gains. And, and so, so, so that's not to say, you know, the, it, it's plausible. In fact, most of what we know of industrialization suggests that in the longer run, the wages for these firms and sorry, the wages for these workers will start going up a lot once the stock of available workers starts to dry up. So as you get more and more firms and they have to compete for labor and la- and skilled labor and experienced labor becomes scarce, then the gains really mm-hmm. start to go. Oh, we're to too, it's still too people. early. A country like Ethiopia is still too early in the process for that. Right. I mean, we've seen this over and over again. Like, there's a reason, you know, everyone focuses in the U.S. of, say, the firms going from the U.S. to Mexico. But, you know, the average American doesn't realize that a lot of the firms left Mexico to go to China. And and real wages have been rising so fast in China that uh, the reason why are these firms coming over and starting to start factories in Ethiopia? Well, it's partly because real wages are going up in China and they're looking for the next place to be able to produce some of these goods. And China will start producing and main, keep producing higher value, higher skilled things that other countries cannot, just like we do. And certain industries, just as they always have, like textiles, will leap to the next low-wage setting. Uh, well, Chris, thank you so much. This was really interesting. And uh, when do you expect the actual full paper to be uh, available for, for publication? Well, it's already available to read, but we'll be like, published yeah the i mean the the in its published in its in its in, in its to be published form it's it's you know available online it's on my website for example which is my name.com chris uh when will <laughs> it just got accepted to something called the american economic journal applied economics uh when when did the, the time from acceptance to actual showing up in print is is who knows probably months maybe maybe shorter maybe longer uh but it's you know it, i think that actual coming out in print has become you know almost mm-hmm. increasingly relevant now that everything's just available online yeah and and you got the new york times op-ed so that's all good that's all. right exactly we we actually got the acceptance from the journal like a few days after that, totally unrelated. I actually wish they would have accepted it before because some economists like to grumble when you publish an op-ed with an unpublished paper. But uh-huh. given how many years it takes to like do this, I think that that's an increasingly silly. Uh, oh, no no silly grumbling situation. from me, Chris. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This was great. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Chris. Love talking to him. That was one was a, a long time coming. I'm glad we had a, a chance to catch up a little bit. All right. We have some good episodes coming up, so stay tuned. And as always, if you have any questions for me or thoughts of people I should interview or topics I should cover or anything else on your mind, you can always send me an email using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. All right. See you later. Bye. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policies or positions of Humanity in Action.